Well, good morning, St. Andrews. I'm going to invite the children up front for our children's time. And for those of you who do not know me, my name is Natalie Jones, and I'm the Director of Children and Family Ministries here at St. Andrews. And it is a pleasure to have you all here on this wonderful Sunday morning. Kids, how are you all doing this morning? You know, I have to tell you guys, you get, you kind of get the best because 930 I'm still mulling through what I'm going to say, and sometimes God works out even different things between 9.30 and 11, which is, he's pretty good like that, pretty awesome. Always teaching. So if you were here last Sunday, we started our Bible study mania for the month of May, and we got to dig into scripture, and we started to read about somebody who started out, as I tell my preschoolers, not so good with a heart that was going after Christians and believers in Jesus, but God had a special encounter with him and changed his heart, and he was no longer that person going after Christians. As a matter of fact, he became a true disciple, an apostle, following after what Jesus wanted, and he really made an incredible impact in bringing in more believers. Do you remember who that person was? His name started out as Saul, but he didn't stay that way because when his heart changed, so did his name. Who was it? Paul, that's right. And so in our scripture today and what you're going to hear Pastor Michael teaching from is one of his letters that he wrote. And I don't know if you remember me saying, but Paul did not have an easy time of it. When he started on the road to going and and telling others about Jesus, he was met with a lot of trouble. And one of those troubles was being thrown into jail. And during this time while he's in jail, he's writing this letter to some people in Ephesus. And this is the book of Ephesians. Does that sound familiar to you all? This is Ephesians chapter 4. And he's like, fine, I'm going to take this opportunity to write. If I can't come and talk to you in person, read this letter. And so I have printed this out a little bit differently than how our Bible says it. But this is Paul's words to us because he never stopped reminding us how to live the way Jesus wants us to live. So in this passage, you guys, he's going to talk about two different roads that we can take. The world tells us one way to follow this way, and then God's word gives us this road to be on. Before we even start, you guys tell me, which road do you think Paul is going to advise us to be on? The way the world tells us to live or the way that God's word tells us to live? What do you think? This one, right? God's word. All right, let's see what his words have to tell us this morning from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. This is what Paul is saying. He says, in light of all of this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here, ooh, he's in jail. I'm a prisoner. I want you to get out there and walk. You know what? Better yet, run on the road that God has called you to travel. Do you remember what our lesson was last week? Jesus gave his disciples a job to do. Do you remember? Go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them what I have taught you, right? Like, go. All of you who believe in me, you got to go. And Paul's reminding us, I don't want you sitting around on your hands, but especially I don't want you strolling down the wrong path. And so he tells you, Go out with humility and discipline, steadily pouring yourself out with acts of love, and always remember to mend fences. So God's word here, what Paul is reminding us is that we have a job to do. We have to pick a path. Are we going to follow what the world is telling us to do, or are we going to follow what God's word? Well, you guys, we've decided, right? If we're following Jesus, we're going to follow his word, his path. And we're supposed to go out and make disciples. But you know what? Sometimes that's hard to do. Because I don't want to seem bossy. Do you want to seem bossy? But you know what? People follow more what you do than what you say. So you've got some friends at school or on your teams. And they're watching. Which road are you following? The one that points them to Jesus or the one that looks pretty familiar because the rest of the world is doing it. This is the road that Paul's telling us, this is the road Jesus wants you on. Yep, it might look a little different, but look around you. 
look at your church family that's on this road with you. If we're all walking together, isn't that going to be amazing and powerful what we can do on this road following God's word? I think so. And I think Paul does too. Will you pray with me this morning? God, I thank you so much. I thank you for each of these kids, God, and the calling that you've placed on their lives. No matter how young they are, God, they can be on a road that's pointing straight to you. Help them to be a light in this world by how they follow you, by in all they say and what they do, God. And I thank you for their families who are leading them on a path that you have called for each of us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for Jesus. Amen. All right, I'm going to have you guys part the seas right here because the Thompson family is coming up for a baptism, and you guys always get the front row seats and invite the Thompsons up forward for their baptism. Good morning. I'm going to invite William and Addie, and you have to have your baby. You can't come out without, uh, like, somebody give. There you go. There he comes. Little William and all who are standing with them to come forward. It's the Thompson family. You're Finn, you're right there. Just have, you're good. Right there, buddy. There you go. Perfect. All right, this is William and Addie, and this is William Charles. Everybody say hi, William. He's awesome. Um, and they're coming for brothers and sisters in Christ. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church, incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation, and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. I present to you, William Charles, for baptism. William and Addie, I ask you on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sins? And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And will all of you standing up here nurture and care for William and Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? And this is a wonderful thing. If you know the Thompson family, you know that he, uh, William has a wonderful mother, but a suspect father. And because of that, yeah, because of that, uh, it, this is something in the family, in our family, St. Andrew's family, as we say every baptism, will you love and care for little William that one day he may be able to accept God's grace for himself? If so, please say we will. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people of slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and William who receives it to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. I'll praise you, Eternal Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Oh, come here, buddy. Hi. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you've never been to a St. Andrew's baptism, this is a moment of celebration when Christ, when God is putting his identity on one of his sons, and so we celebrate that, not in the same way you would at a stuffy old church, but in the way you would at some arena somewhere. So we baptize you, William Charles, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we mark the sign of the cross on your forehead to denote you are a seal child of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. William. <laughs> All right, and this time, kiddos, I invite you to go back to your families. If you at all would stand and sh greet one another in the peace of Christ. Peace be with you.
All right, all right, all right, that's plenty. Plenty of peace, that's enough peace. Everybody have a seat. Please take your seats. Totally forgot. Um, at this time, you know, today is a very special day. Yes, it is the day of William, but it is also Mother's Day. And because it's Mother's Day, we want to have a, a few moments. Lisa gathered this together. and We have three mothers uh, who are going to come and share kind of their perspective, different ages and stages of life. Melissa Benson, uh, Jenny Kern, and Ashley Blake. And I'm going to invite Melissa to lead us off. Good morning. My name is Melissa Benson, as he said. My husband, Mike, and I are the parents of Catherine, Kyle, and Nathan. Our oldest two are married, performed by Michael Crocker, so we know it's official. And the third has a delightful girlfriend that we consider family also. Family is important to me. I'm the youngest of five kids. My dad worked, and my mom stayed at home with us. Once I was in school, mom began helping at the family printing shop doing church newsletters. Ironic, huh? In literary terms, I think they call that foreshadowing. <clears throat> we didn't have a lot, but mom made sure our home was filled with love and God and her delicious cooking, so we were happy. I didn't fully understand that the faith and endurance it took to be a mom until I became one. I remember returning from a family trip with our kids when they were young and immediately called my mom to apologize. I never knew all it took to keep everything running smoothly and to make it look so effortless. I had a whole new sense of gratitude and appreciation for who she was and all that she had done for our family. Now that our kids are grown up and mostly off our payroll, Mike and I recently had the opportunity to visit Italy and went to the Duomo in Milan. It reminded me of something I read years ago, comparing motherhood to building cathedrals, entitled The Invisible Mother by Nicole Johnson. She explains that mothers often can't be seen in their efforts, and some days they are merely a pair of hands, try tying shoes or opening containers, but mothers are building cathedrals. She goes on to say that the builders of cathedrals made great sacrifices, knowing they would never see the true impact of these structures. Their passion was fueled by the faith that God saw their efforts. What a beautiful analogy of motherhood. In looking for that article, I found Dear Mama, You Are Also a Cathedral by Emily Roussel. In it, she says to all mothers, just like the grand cathedrals have been the centers of their towns and villages, you are the center of your family. You are the gathering place, the grounding place, and the warming place your people come to to be nurtured and have their souls tended. And that was my mom. She was our place. She warmed and nurtured us. She had a strong faith, loved well, and served selflessly. There's nothing more that I hope to do for my children than to be their place of love, acceptance, and a sense of home. Please welcome Jenny Curran. Good morning. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. The love that is spoken in this verse reminds me of the kind of love a mother gives to her children. Maybe not the quick to anger part, but we're all working on that. We try. I was blessed with a mother that did and does love me in all of these ways. 
and taught me the importance of how to love my babies, Ellie, Will, and Cooper, in the same ways that are spoken here in 1 Corinthians. The best way I truly can love my children is to make sure that they know praise and how to love our Lord God. My mom taught me by example, always taking us to church, doing her Bible studies in the living room where others could always see, and always having the ability to see her pray. My hope and prayer is that I have shown my kids the divine importance of worshiping, asking for forgiveness, giving thanks for all of our blessings, and learning how to lean into God and asking him to carry us so close during hard times and knowing that he does. And to know that a relationship with Jesus is the most important relationship that there is. Having a strong relationship with God has helped me to be a better mom for sure. And I pray that my kids see that Jesus lives within me and that they in return will search their hearts and have a life of peace, happiness, and joy that only he can provide. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Happy Mother's Day. And now here is Ashley Blake. Amazing job to my sisters. Um, sorry, I get nervous all of a sudden. Uh, my name's Ashley Blake. Um, I am part of the Blake family, 11 o'clock in the balcony every week. Um, my husband is Chris, and my oldest son is Anderson, who will be a senior next year, which I just can't believe it. And my youngest is Ames, who will be in seventh grade next year. And I'm just holding on so tight because I know how fleeting time with them is and how quickly they grow. I thank you. I thank you so much, Father God, for my boys and my family, for making me a mom, or sometimes mommy, mama, mother, but often bruh. A lot of times, bruh. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll thank God for all of that. And when I was a teenager full of hormones and actions that I truly didn't understand, a lot of eye rolls or mumbling under my breath, my mom would hug me and say, I will love you through this. And she would hug me and hug me until I finally would hug her back. And when she would say that, she would say it like a mantra. I will love you through this. I am loving you through this. I am loving you through this. I, I really think it was for her own sanity um, until, I, until I gave in and embraced her. And I, I remember those times so much. And now that I am a mom of two boys growing in life and exploring their independence, I understand. I really understand. And I've learned that no matter how big, how big your babies get, that sometimes all they need is a hug. And you need that, you desperately need that connection with them. So always, always hug them and love them through it. I'm incredibly grateful to be a daughter of God, Jehovah, and to be growing so much in my walk with him especially during a time of raising young men. And he guides me, and he shows his love through whatever, whatever we face as a family, because he is always loving us all through it. And so thank you, God, for guiding my steps through the incredible times and through the really hard times. I am your daughter. And I'm blessed to be a mom with your love shining through me and always lighting my path. And I want to take this time to close and just encourage you as parents, mothers, fathers, join a small group. 
and I mean a really small group, three to five people that you can come together with on a weekly basis and praise when great things are happening with your family and to cry and pray when you're struggling or just needing an ear. Um, it's been a blessing to be in a small group with these ladies and my sister Christy, my balcony sister up there. It makes such a difference to come together as moms. So thank you guys. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Please join me in thanking these beautiful moms. Please stand as we sing this, this song, this anthem, as we bless mothers everywhere, as we bless some of us. I know Manuel over here just lost his mother several weeks ago. So there are some who are just celebrating Mother's Day without their own mother. And we bless you. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you.
Come on, you got more in that. Hallelujah. All right, turn to somebody and say Happy Mother's Day, even if they're not a mother. Say Happy Mother's Day and then sit down. Do it quickly. I have very little time and a lot to get to. You may sit. Good morning. I want to take a second and look into the lens, say good morning to everybody watching online. We're so glad that you have joined with us. My name is Pastor Michael, one of the pastors here, and thanks for being with us. Those of you in-house, good morning, Balcony. Hello, Nave. Right side. Come on, right side. Bring it today. Left side. Delayed there, Lisa. Um, good morning. We are excited that you are with us today. There is a lot for me to get to. I want to make two quick announcements. One, it's Mother's Day, and what a wonderful thing by Melissa, Ashley, and Jenny. Thanks for being up here. Um, I usually have all the moms stand. Every single one of us had a mother. Not all of us knew her, and some of us wish we didn't, um, and that's the reality uh, of it. Uh, some of us had great moms like I did, um, but there's also other women in our lives, spiritual mothers that came alongside us and that show us the attribute of God that is nurturing, that is caring, that is loving. Um, and so thank you, moms. The, those of you who are natural moms and those of you who are spiritual moms, thank you. And may God bless you, not just today that Hallmark decided we had to recognize you, um, but every day uh, for what you do. Thank you uh, for, for doing what you do. The second thing is, and I, I just want to say this, very, I'm going to say very quickly, not spend a lot of time on it, because some questions were asked by some folks at the 11 o'clock service last week. Uh, because I had said immediately following VBS, once we have, we're going to have like almost 500 folks coming through here on VBS. Come on, somebody. That is awesome. Um, and they've been working super hard. And let's be honest, after, after that many kids in this room, this church may not be standing any longer. Anyways, but we said that we're going to start construction right after that. Um, but we're not ready um, because God gave us bigger vision. Um, and so it, construction is not happening. Some people are like, are we moving out in June? No, uh, we're, we're not. We're going to be clear. God said... You're not dreaming big enough. Um, and so we've refined and are pushing forward. Um, and so we'll let you know about those steps, but um, it's, I'm excited. Uh, I'll tell you that. I'm, I'm pumped, I'm thrilled, but it's not happening this summer. I'm bummed about that, um, but thrilled where God is, is leading us. Um, but today is uh, the second part of our series called Our House. And we started it last week in talking, it was our birthday, right? And we celebrated our birthday. And so it just felt like an opportune time to say, okay, who are we as a church? Who is God calling us to be? Who were we? When we started in 1952, who were we when we broke away and got freedom last year, and, and who are we going forward? And, and so we're, gonna, we're looking at it. And last week we said that the, very, the most important thing about our house is it better be a house that talks about Jesus. Like it better be a house when someone comes in here, they know who is the king, the king of kings, the one who took the cross, who died and conquered death for our sake. That's the number one thing. And it's not just my job, it, it's our job. It's our house. And our house needs to go further. We're going to talk about it. I'm going to give you a little disclaimer right here that some of you are going to stop listening to my sermon at some point. Like some of you already have, but that's neither here nor there. At some point you're going to stop listening and you might get upset about what I say. Please know that this is not, that when I get to that point, you'll know what it is. I'm not speaking from a place of judgment. I'm speaking from a place of care and love. Truly it. Um, so, you're like, now I'm really curious. That got some of you to listen. Um, so Paul writes this letter. Have you ever written anything that was so good that you're like, I need to share this with other people? Like an email, you're like, dude, I nailed it. Or a text message, and you're like, that, I just need to show this to people. That was awesome. So Paul writes this letter to the, Col the city of Colossa. We call it Colossians. And he, I, my belief is he sat back and he read it, and he's like, that's really good stuff. Like, I need to share this with more people than just them. Because when he writes to the, the people of Colossa, it's very localized. He's writing something that's very specific to the people who live there. And he's like, but this needs to be heard by everybody. So he writes a letter to Ephesus. And, and he sends it to the city of Ephesus. We call it Ephesians. But really, he wants it to be circulated throughout Asia to all of the churches there. Because what he does is he takes this nugget from Colossians and he expands on it. And, and what the nugget is, is it's about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. Like, like Jesus, who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what that does for us. And he lays it out. And so in, in Ephesians, the first three chapters are kind of him going through that again, expanding on who Jesus, the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, and then what that means for us. And then the other three chapters, the, the second half of the letter to the, the Ephesians is about, okay, so what do you do with it? 
So what do you do? If, if you truly believe all of this stuff and you step into a life with Christ, then what's next? So there's a word that you should listen to for in scripture. When you hear this word, you're like, pay attention, because everything that's about to follow is what came, is, is because of what just happened. And the word is therefore. Therefore is a very big, uh, what Paul uses this, therefore. Well, therefore what? Well, Jesus. Therefore, do this. And so Paul gets to the do this section in chapter four, verse one. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, he's in prison when he writes this, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. Paul begins the second part of this letter to the Ephesians, to letter to the church of Asia, the letter to us, by really giving us a summary of who we are. Like, he talks about it, your calling. And, and it's a pluralized form there. It's y'all, it's y'all's calling is what he's saying. Hey, y'all's calling is all the same. Every single one of us has the same calling. It is to share the gospel message with everyone we come in contact with. Every single one of us has been giving that calling now, individually, it's going to look very different. Individually, our callings are gonna be more specialized. There are some people in this room who should never be up here with a microphone. You know who you are. And the people who sit in front of you also know who you are. You can't sing. You shouldn't be up here proclaiming God's glory with a microphone. That's okay. There's people up here, Lisa shouldn't be doing some of the things that you do because she wasn't created the way that you were created. But we all have the same calling. We have that same calling that's gonna be born out in our life by the way that God has created us to share the gospel message of hope, of peace, of love with the world. That's what our church should be doing, right? That's what our church should do every Sunday. But Paul gives us some things of how it should look. He's like, hey, here's some attributes of how I think this should look. And the first one was, he said, with humility. And humility, and you know, when we hear that, we're like, well, duh. Of course, a Christian needs to be humble. But when Paul writes this to Ephesus, humility wasn't a virtue that people wanted. In the Greek world, humility was seen as those who just didn't have it together. Like, you're humble because you're a loser. But for a Christian, yes, we're humble because our Savior was humble. We have humility because that's how he led. Humility, he says. The second thing he says is with gentleness. Right? There's a gentleness, and, and the word can also be translated as meekness. And meekness, again, when you hear that, you're like, well, I don't want to be meek. Remember when Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, the meek shall inherit the earth? And you're like, I don't understand how that works. The meek are the ones who get pushed down. But what he needs, means by this gentleness is you're angry at the right time. You're angry at the right time. Listen to that. Isn't that, That's just some serious wisdom there from Paul. That there are moments when anger is justified and right. Jesus led his life with gentleness, but there were moments where brother got mad. Sometimes you should be angry. Gentleness. The third thing he says is love. That love needs to be this driving force, and there's four different Greek words to describe love. The one he uses here is agape. And agape love can be translated as charity. It's putting others before yourself, thinking of others more highly than yourself. I love you because Christ loved me. I give to you because he gave to me this agape love. And when you have those three things, it comes to this, this peace-filled life. And peace here, the word he uses, really kind of means to be in right relationship with someone else. Isn't that a great way to think about it? To be in right relationship. Because it doesn't mean that I have to agree with what you're talking about or where you come from, all that stuff. It just means that I have a right relationship with you. And a right relationship isn't antagonistic or violent peace. Paul drops all of this stuff. He goes, hey, you're calling, and your calling is the same, but live it through humility. 
gentleness, through love, peace. But let's be honest, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna talk about that, how many of you, would, if you're gonna describe yourself, would say humility? <laughs> yeah. Gentleness, sure, got that one. Love, mm -hmm. yeah, peace, nailed all four, right? Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. We're perfect in every way, right? It, like how many of us can really, but this is what Paul's saying, when you live out your calling, do it like this, because there's one God, and he's called every single one of us to do this. Here's where he wraps it up, and this is the beautiful part. He's like, you can't do it on your own. You, you can't live a life for Jesus in a silo. You can't live a life for Jesus without surrounding yourself with other folks who believe what you believe. The world wants to separate us and the world wants to get in and cause fractions and fissures and all those things, but God says, no, 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 there is one God, one baptism, there is one son who died for us all. Can I challenge you, and this is where you can start hating me. You can't do it by playing the majors. Let me explain that. What do I mean by playing the majors? You show up Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day. It's playing the majors. That's what a lot of people, um, some, some pastors call them C CMEs. Others call them CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. But if you look at church attendance across the board, why Mother's Day is a major is because attendance on Mother's Day is generally one of the higher Sundays of the year. Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day. By the way, I can't remember who it was who told me playing the majors. Um, we were playing golf at the time, and it was somebody who is in this room, I'm quite certain, and he goes, yeah, we usually play the majors, and we show up on that one. I was like, that's the funniest thing ever. You're gonna burn in hell, but that is so funny. You're going to shank your next shot, brother. You, you can't do this without being surrounded on a regular basis by other people who love you and support you. As Ashley said, going through those wonderful times, you have somebody to celebrate with you. Going through those difficult times, you have someone to pray with you. Like, we can't expect to go into the world and carry the cross of Christ with us in an effective way if we're not constantly surrounding ourselves with his message of hope, peace, and love. Look, listen, the reason these people are up here and volunteering and giving of their time is so that they can worship over you, so that they can worship with you. Our prayer team who stands up front and back to pray every Sunday, they're here to be with you. If you miss a Sunday, let me tell you, it matters. It matters. Now, I, look, I want, is, the, what, what we're doing with our sanctuary is we're making it bigger because there's not enough seats in here. You know how I know that? Because there's a lot of people who don't know Jesus in our community. If you miss a Sunday, you're missing something. Those of you who watch online, I love you. you look, my, my fans in New Jersey, what up, Garden State? I understand why you're not here because that would be really hard to do. Those of you who live here, be here. It matters. It matters when you come. It gives you strength. It gives you power because you get to feel and experience what Paul was praying for us right before he said, therefore. See, what he says right before therefore, at the end of chapter three, he does this beautiful prayer blessing over every single one of us. He says, I pray that you would know how wide and how deep and how long the love of Christ is for you. And I pray that the God of all power would make his power complete inside of you. If you're missing a Sunday, it's like, I don't need all the power. It's like going to the gas station and going, quarter tank's fine, I can make it. Those of you with electric vehicles, first of all, why? But it's like going on a road trip and understanding that there's not a charge station in your journey. And God's like, come, get refilled, get refueled, come connect with me, enable me to grow in you. And guess what? You might be the person that's gonna help someone beside you or behind you or in front of you grow also, to experience the fullness of Christ inside them. If we are a church who is following what God has asked us to do, our house can't be empty. There should never be a time where our house sits empty. There should never be a time. Look, we have some seats. I, I'm looking around and it's full today, but we have seats over there. 
So if you're watching online or if you know somebody, come. If you're here for the first time because you just love little William, hi, thanks, welcome to our church. Um, come back or go to your other church. If you go to another church, go to your church. We don't wear suits, but, you know, I'm just throwing that out there as an option. <laughs> but it looks good on you, First Pres. No, whatever you're doing. <laughs> good night, everybody. Tip your weight stuff. Your presence here matters. Your presence here matters because it allows God to shape you into who he longs for you to be so that you can go and bring Jesus with you. Our house will not be empty. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the ways that you move in our life. God, I thank you so much for this church, for your church, for your house. I thank you for your son, Jesus, who we come in and we worship and we celebrate and we say, yes, Lord, but God, let it not be something that just stops here and as soon as we exit, we forget it. That we carry it with us throughout the week, that we are people of light, in a world of darkness. And God, if there's someone in here this morning who, who came for a baptism, came for the promise of lunch, maybe they're watching online sometime today or throughout the week, and they don't know you, they've never experienced the freedom that comes with saying yes to you, God, let today be the day. They say yes to you. I'm tired of being beat down by the world and I'm ready to step into the life of the kingdom of God. God, we thank you for those decisions that are being made for the first time, those decisions that are being made to strengthen our relationships with you and to commit to coming into your kingdom and worshiping. Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand and worship one time, more, more time with us. The ushers are coming forward and we're gonna pass the offertory. Most of you give online these days, but, but your giving allows us to be in places where, where tornadoes, this last week when these tornadoes have gone through, you have been on the ground immediately after. St. Andrews, because of your giving, we have been able to go in the name of Jesus to places and offer hope and relief for folks who've been struck by tragedy. So thank you for that. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you have given us. All that we have is yours. And so now we take a moment to give back to you, receive this offering, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, magnify its use that ministry may be done in your name that others may know they're loved by you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to this time with your whole heart and your hands open receive this blessing may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you lift his countenance unto you and give you his peace amen amen happy mother's day god bless you all have a wonderful week we'll see you next week